All right. Hi, I'm Jim Cunningham. I've got Phil Blancato and Christina Lindsay Orta here today to talk about all the craziness that's going in the market. You know, I look at the news and I see red. It's all I see, Phil, Christina. A lot of my clients are freaked out. A lot of them are worried. A lot aren't. But Phil, you're a great source of knowledge. Um, and Christine, if you'd like to introduce Phil and, and his yeah. role and, and how you all work together. Yeah, so we also have um, Jim, I know, thank you for helping host this and, and co-host this. We have a lot of our um, clients on the line as well that are um, clients for many years. And I know that, um, you know, a lot of our longtime clients that have been with us for um, a decade or two decades have, have been through these ups and downs before. And um, this is a re real reversion to normal um, to have this kind of volatility in the market. It's a little exacerbated, you know, typically a midterm election year, you have 40% more volatility, but um, this is a reversion to normal. We've kind of been spoiled without as much market volatility the last few years, uh, pandemic aside. Um, but we want to make sure that we talk about that and give some people some some real tools as to why uh, things are happening and and what's going on. So Phil Blancato with uh, Ladenberg Thalman Asset Management, um, and uh, he and I have been working together for about the last eight years, um, partnering on a lot of our client portfolios. And one of the things I can say is in working over time with Ladenberg uh, and Phil and his team. I've never had to apologize to clients for their portfolios over time. You know, you might have these short-term um, pullbacks in the market, but I can tell you I did, I've done a lot of client reviews and even year to date, if client portfolios are down, they're not down as much as the market. Uh, and um, it's about measuring that drawdown, you know, being down 10% is still painful, but if the NASDAQ's down 24%, you know, it, it, it's it's not without pain to be down, but um, when we look at the the long term averages, um, our clients are still doing great, and um, and that's one of the things that's important to remember is it's time in the market versus timing the market. So I want to have Phil. Um, many of you have have maybe met Phil. Some of you might be on here for the first time, but a lot of our clients um, have have met Phil. Jim, you and I have done webcasts with Phil over the years. And um, those of you that are new, uh, Phil, regularly, you're on um, Fox Business every week on Wednesdays. Yes. And um, so it might be a familiar face for many and has been featured in many different uh, outlets, Wall Street Journal, Fox Business, CNBC, Reuters. Um, so without further ado, Phil, um, I'm sure there's a lot of fear uh, that we need to ease some people's minds of, are we heading into a recession? What's going on with the markets? Um, so... Um, if you can enlighten us, that would be great. Sure. First off, it's a pleasure to be back. Thank you, both Jim and Christina, for having me. And yes, Christina, I've known for a long, long time, and uh, uh, a friend, and uh, I admire her family as well. Her dad, someone I've gotten to know quite well over the years as well. So we would gladly take any questions along the way. At the bottom of your screen, there, you're going to see uh, a Q and A or a chat box. If you touch on either one of those, I'll be able to answer those for you as I go through, so you don't have to wait. I already have one from Anita. Yeah. Pulido, thank you. I'll get to that in just a second. It's an excellent question. Um, so I would start off with a couple of fun facts just to think about. First off, if you went back to 1980, uh, the average return of the markets just in general is positive. Believe it or not, but it's positive 80% of the time since 1980 forward, the stock market's positive. Go one further, since 1980 forward, our average correction per year is negative 14%. Now, some years there were none, and some years there were, there were deeper ones, but generally, these moments happen every single year. And most importantly, when you start to think about statistics, and for what I do for a living, statistics really matter. Using history as a guide and understanding that we've been here before and not panicking is probably the most essential thing I do every day, is to try and calm folks down that, it's never nearly as bad as it seems. And going one further, it generally represents an opportunity. So one of the telltale signs, and I kind of joke about this, is we, we manage a lot of uh, pension fund business, 401k business, things like that. And what we see when things get haywire like this is that the worst of it, people start changing their 401ks and making them more conservative at exactly the worst time. So we're seeing a lot of that right now. So it tells me we're probably closer to the end than the beginning. But give you an example of being, to Christina's point, which is really well said, you simply can't time the markets. And I'll give you a fun, simple fact. If you started in 1940 and you looked at every decade from 1940 to now, 
and you just took out the 10 best days, just the 10 best days, your total return, if you had invested day one of 1940, January 1st, till the end of 2021, your return would have been 50%, or probably a good number. If you didn't try and take your money out and didn't miss those 10 best days, your return would be 25,000%. So to wrap in, in context, and it's quite incredible to think how much the market's grown. And you go one further, you realize that opportunities like this represent purely opportunity to invest the markets. Volatility is opportunity. And when I say opportunities like this, I mean, I see this as the greatest opportunity I've had to make money in the stock market since 2020. And before that, since 2018, the last two times we've had significant corrections. There's some subtle differences this time, like interest rates going higher. We generally don't see that a lot. The last 40 years, that's only happened a handful of times. And certainly there is a key, a key point. The return to normalcy has created a lot of consternation. Stock companies made 40% earnings growth last year. They're making about eight this year. So going back to normal meant stock market was going to be challenged. But it means it's an opportunity because no different than when you go to your grocery store. And I'm going to bet when you look at the cereal aisle, you think about the different prices on each box. And when we see that little tag that says two for one or 30% discount, isn't our eye always drawn to that one that's on sale, at least to look at it first? So what do we have for the first time? Arguably, in 12 years, stocks are finally fairly valued. You're paying normal market prices for stocks. And in that, there's a couple of them that are for sure on sale. I can think of a few great tech names. I'm more of a dividend buyer today. I like to earn dividends in time of volatility. But for someone who's got long-term money, would I want to own a Microsoft here? Or give me a fun stat on Microsoft. 20% of the American companies today use cloud computing to store their data. That means 80% do not. What's the number one cloud computing firm in the country and arguably the world? That would be Microsoft. What's expected between now and 2030? That 80 to 90% of every company in the country will use cloud computing. Where would I make a long-term multi-decade multi bet? On Microsoft. Why? Because it's on sale right now. It's finally cheaper than it's been at any time in recent memory. So I want to start with saying, don't panic. Panic is bad. Panic is what folks do who don't have people who can help them. That's why you have Jim and Christina and me behind the scenes to help you. Panic gives me opportunity to make money. Panic, when people get fearful in the markets, they do fearful and silly things. They'll sell at the bottom and buy at the top. That's our job to help you not do that. And that's what today's about. That this is not about panic. There's a lot of reasons to believe the U.S. economy is excellent, not good, excellent. There are strength in the underlying economy that is quite strong. We're going to talk about that. And there's reasons why this is happening, which are quite normal. Not Russia, Ukraine, uh, to a degree inflation, but not totally. To a degree of the Fed, but not totally. Certainly, it's about taking advantage of the opportunities the markets present itself. And that's where I think we're, we're going to jump into. But let me start off. Anita. Her question was, would I address a short-term client should consider at this time? That's a great question. So in the short term, because there is significant volatility, we are losing money in stocks and in bonds. And I think we actually continue to lose money in stocks for the better part through the mid to late July. And I'll explain later why, but it's about when I think the Fed will, will pause for the first time and raising rates will be mid to late July. So if you're very short in nature, there is a number of products Christina has access to, which can invest your money for a one to three month time period, if that's how short you are. If short means to you a year or two, we can do things modestly differently. Doesn't mean without risk, but the beauty of short right now is three months ago, you couldn't really make any interest at all in a short product. Now we could probably make it around one and a half percent. So for, if it's a one or two year time frame, we can probably get you the money around one, one and a half percent after fees that will give you a parking spot for at least the next couple of years if that's what you're looking for. But but the truth be told, when stocks are now losing money and, and bonds are losing money, when they both lose money together, there's not a lot of places you can hide out. So I, if you really want the best place to hide out and, and time's really short, cash. I don't, we don't like going to cash, but if you said to me I was going to have this money for next, you needed the next two, three months, uh, I would go to cash. All right. Not an easy question to answer, though. That's where you want to come to Christina. What's your total financial picture look like? And that, that or, or Jim, depending on who you're working with, but what's your total financial picture look like? And I actually think stocks are really cheap here and would expect a rally in them. So I wouldn't want you to miss out on that either. So again, you can ask questions on the bottom there with the chat and I will gladly try and pick them up. I wanna talk about a few things today that I think will help, help kind of lay out where we're going. First off, you obviously know Christina and Jim and, 
and and I'm and I'm a partner to them and, and been working with them for for a long period of time. I do want to mention the virus for only a moment, and there is something going on in the virus that I think is critically important. While in the United States, case counts are back up to around 60,000 a day, and probably, to be honest, four or five times that, the United States has now become a very mild cold. In the rest of the world, we're seeing fatalities, are you ready for this, at the lowest level we've seen them since the pandemic began. That's on a global basis. We're many days on a global basis between 1,500 and 1,000. We've even had a couple of days of sub-1,000 fatalities globally. Part of it's the data that probably not being recorded the way once it was, but it a hundred million people now that are in one form or another of a lockdown. The supply chain has been hurt again. We're looking at, uh, they're operating at about 75% of capacity. Their GDP, their ability to grow is down to around 4%, which is the lowest it's been, been since the pandemic began. They're not a country that believes in using fiscal stimulus to get things going again. And if you think about the pressure on the supply chain in the United States, while it's eased quite a bit this year, it has improved significantly. Number of ships off the port of LA have come down from over 150 to sub 40. Some of that seasonality, in fairness, we don't use as much stuff this time of year. We will begin the, uh, the buying season again soon. But beyond that, the supply chain has healed itself. Actually, we have more of an issue in the United States finding truck drivers to move things off the dock of LA rather than actually getting them uh, off a ship. But if China, and you saw this in Apple, when Apple announced that they had a really difficult time with the, the, the supply chain beginning to hold, hold them up again and it's gonna hurt their revenue, Apple sold off significantly. If you look at why Walmart and Target also had similar situations, inflated prices, gasoline costs, but also inventory issues, where they're getting too much of some things and not enough of others, very lumpy inventory scenario. So that supply chain issue is still here and it's simply because of, as of now the B2 variant and just over the weekend, the B3 and the B4 variants came out of South Africa that are probably going to sweep the world again. Not now, though, most of the world has very high levels of, of immunity, whether it's through vaccines or just natural immunity, which is far and away the prevailing reason why in the United States, we're probably in the United States, believe it or not, I don't use these, the CDC estimates. I use Goldman Sachs for their tracker. And they're, you're looking about 85% of the country has natural immunity at this point. Uh, so the numbers are quite significantly different. So it's not really an American issue for us, assuming there's not a terrible variant that would break through immunity and so on. But Assuming that's not the case, the disease is mostly endemic here. It's not in China. And then their vaccines didn't really hold up. And then beyond that, they tried to go to a zero COVID strategy and it just hasn't worked. So that's something to keep a close eye on. We've got two questions. I love it. Let me jump into those questions. Uh, how about going into going short in the declining market from Charles Tang? So shorting is an interesting philosophy. I, I for very speculative investors, do some, some shorting. Problem is, it's a very speculative thing. And shorting in and of itself has to be predicated on the ability to take outsized risk with your assets in a way that can lead to catastrophic loss. So for another, if you go short the market, and let's just make it up, that tomorrow, Russia, Ukraine come to the peace treaty, and all OPEC decides it's going to go and crank up its oil by maybe 500,000 500, barrels a day, the market would reverse in the blink of an eye. So if you're gonna short, and, and we only we do shorting in indexes, uh, I would recommend you create a barbell strategy. What you wanna do is use options or have, have a counterbalance to the short side so you're not short only. I don't like to do it because truth be told, too many things can get, get in the way of being short. It's a very speculative trade. I would only, if you're gonna go short, use a levered index to do it. Uh, and that's one, one way to be in and out of the market much faster than being short a particular Security. One other way to do it, which I like much better, the way I would short is, let's say you have some stocks you really like. Microsoft, we use that same name again. Buy a put. You can buy a protective put at a specific price that if the stock falls below that price, that puts down the money and acts as a hedge and less of a short. That's how you win the short side of the business. Just shorting in general, too much speculation. I'm not a fan. Next question from Susan Floyd. For just retired folks, how many months, years do you recommend to uh, to to have cash or have cash on hand. I'll take you know, that one. I was gonna say, Christina, you beat me to it. Go ahead, Christina. Yeah, I'll take that one. You know, and I think with most, um, I'm, sorry. I'm sharing an office with John. John, can you shut my door, please? Thanks. <laughs> um, the uh, with 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 cash on hand, I would say 
you know, most of the time with reti recently retired or newly retired folks, we try to keep a year's, not cash, but, you know, I like to have my clients have at least six months of cash in the bank. And then beyond six months, you know, cash really isn't working for you. So short-term investments, but if we have, you know, a year or 18 months of short-term investments to meet all of our needs for monthly distributions, we're not in a position where we're having to liquidate something that's down 20% in the market or down 10% in the market to meet our monthly income needs. So making sure that we have a bucket of short duration investments that we can pull from that aren't gonna be sold while the market's down is key. So each client's different, but we typically rule of thumb wanna make sure that they've got six months of cash in the bank as well as a year's worth of short duration investments that we can manage um, based on the client's needs. Hey, Christina, I read an article um, that suggested, and I think we've talked about this in the past, if you're just retiring and your retirement is 35 years, let's say, whatever it is, something you may wanna consider is essentially not being invested for the first two or three years. Um, any thoughts on that? Cause I know that that sort of, that thinking is out there so that yeah, you can have a two or three years right. is excessive. Okay. Um, and two or three years of being in cash in an inflationary market like today, where you're losing 8% just to sit in cash is not good either. So, you know, it's, it's having a plan and um, stress testing your plan. And if it's, if it's not a comprehensive plan, then, you know, it, it's going to be slightly different for each client, but we want to make sure that we're investing in short duration investments, maybe some certain types of fixed income, floating rate, inflation protected, right. that we can get some yield better than cash. Kelly has a question. Um, with the volatility around, volatility around the world, is it better to invest in dollars, euros, or crypto? Kelly, I'm going to tell you on crypto, one of the challenges as from the estate planning standpoint is if somebody is not able to access their password or their or their token or whatever it is, if you don't have that ability to do that because you've been incapacitated or pass away, sometimes those assets just evaporate. So if you guys have crypto, if you're watching this and you have crypto, you really do need to pay attention on how it's held and whether you can put it into a trust or not, whether you're using a hard wallet, a soft wallet, uh, whatever it is, but you really do need to pay attention to that. But Phil, do you wanna, do you wanna answer that one? Yeah, squirrel, the US dollar is the strongest market in the world, strongest economy in the world, not wise to be invested overseas and crypto as of right now due to being faced with significant financial regulation from the federal government, I think it's not a good idea besides what Jim just said. So I would say- I heard, dollars yeah, world. I heard a statistic a couple of days ago that uh, the cryptocurrencies, the main ones, uh, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, are all trading now with the same exact volatility directly correlated to the NASDAQ. So it's no longer a diversifier like most people had hoped for. Not to say that there's not, you know, still some opportunity in cryptocurrency, but it, the, it's not a diversifier the way it's trading just like tech. So with tech being down 25% for the market, um, you know, it, it's, you're not getting the diversification people hoped for. So, um, and I, well, we'll answer questions live because it is, is helpful to keep it going, but I want to make sure we give Phil some time yeah. to cover some, some key points. So Phil, if we can keep going through that, we don't, that way we don't lose time to go over the important stuff. That'd be great. No problem at all. And Kelly had a second question about CDs. Uh, I'll just say, I do think if you're a short-term investor, there's a chance to do some of that, but it's, a, it's about building the right portfolio based on your time. So short answers with rates pushing higher, eventually CDs might make a way to be very short and protect the money, but short means less income too. So that's a conversation around how much time you have. All right, a couple of things to talk about. First off, excuse me, the one thing about the that the United States is quite unusual is that considering the rest of the world is flat or even trending significantly down, we did have a very difficult first quarter. That's that negative 1.4, but not because the US economy didn't grow. It actually grew quite well. It's just that the dollar being so strong means we bought more stuff in than, st than sent stuff out, pure product. That'll reverse in the second quarter. And we're probably on average this year gonna grow around three and a half percent. Oddly enough, China for projected to grow around four and a quarter percent this year. That spread, if we end up at three and a half as the United States and China at four and a quarter would be the lowest spread or the lowest difference between the two in the modern era. We, uh, we have been always much, uh, much bigger economy growing at a slower rate than China. To be a bigger economy and growing almost at the same rate it's a little bit how I just mentioned how China is struggling to get their exports going again because of their COVID situation. 
So it eventually could hurt us as well. But more importantly, right now, look at my last bullet point there. If you see down here at the bottom, that business investment surged in the first quarter to 9.2% on an annualized rate. That means that companies are spending on their own company. Go one further. If you look at actually revenue, how much companies are making, we made around 13% of pure bottom line revenue. That's the highest number ever, ever in the modern era again. Call what call does it. that mean, Phil? So it means if you run a company and you made a dollar in gross sales, you end up with 13 cents in your pocket. That's, that's national. A, that's national. All company. Wow. That's a fantastic number. Why? Because companies really cut costs during the pandemic. Uh, and that, so at a time when the stock market is going through real gyrations, we're not, key take, perverse, first takeaway of the day here, we're not in a scenario where companies aren't still earning money. They're just earning less or going, to use Christina's point from earlier, going back to somewhat of a normal state. Normal earnings growth for companies is around 5 to 10%. What's happening right now is as we go back to normal earnings growth, pure profits as a percentage of gross revenue are staying pretty high. So that's a great sign that the stock market is not only finally fairly valued or not expensive anymore. It offers means there's opportunity to buy in this market because companies are still earning money. Now, I can't skip past the first point. Consumer spending. As the federal government's getting out of the way in supporting the economy of buying its own bond or printing paper, we need the consumer to step in and take over. And squarely, that's exactly what happened. That consumer spending, you see that bullet point there, on a seasonally adjusted basis, grew at an annual rate of 2.7%. Personal consumption of expenditures, PCE. It's the Fed's favorite gauge when they're talking about what they're looking at when it comes to inflation. Now, that's really important because you look at the rate of growth of inflation, the consumer is, in effect, outspending the rate of inflation on a seasonally adjusted basis. So in other words, on a month-to-month -month basis, we're spending more than it's cost to live right now. Critical point. The consumer is still sitting around $2.5 trillion in cash. And why that matters, if you look at my third bullet point down on the left right there, even going back over the last few years and, and even my second bullet point, what you've done is you've taken millions of people and uplifted them with a wage increase. Now, I know some of you may think about that and say, wage increases are bad, it's inflationary. Not correct. So much of the talk today is about that wages are going to create this high level of inflation. That's not how it works. What's happening now is for the first time in 30 years, you're having people who make less than $100,000 get a significant bump in wages, anywhere from a 6 to a 15% bump. And yes, that is a bit inflationary. But inflation and wages are only a small piece of what corporations pay to survive. It's much more about the products that they make and how they make their margin. So what you've done effectively is increase the number of consumers who can buy things, generate more tax, make a better, stronger consumer. So now the byproduct of that is today, the consumer has tremendous pent up demand from being in the pandemic. And go on further, if you look at my three pie charts here, on the left, the 40 year average of what you, when you think about how much debt we have is about 11% of what we totally owe, or what we totally have, what we're, what we're worth. In 2007, it grew to 12.9%. In fact, at one point it got to 13.2 uh, just recently as an all time high. It fell as low as 8.2 in 2021, and now we're back to 9.1. If I took it out, you see that's Q2 2021, even now the number hasn't changed right now. So basically what it means is you have the lowest levels of debt in the, in the last, call it 30 years, 40 years. And by that, not only do you have low levels of debt, the cost of financing debt, the interest payments on there are still very low. Even though rates have come up a bit, it means you have a lot of debt, I mean, you have a little bit of debt with very low interest rates on it, and then add to that, you've got a lot of cash, two and a half trillion dollars. And you're making more money in wages and you're gainfully employed. For every job seeker today, for everyone looking for a job today, there's two to three jobs open. So we've got opportunity to work. What it tells me that the US consumer is extremely strong. That's why the retail sales number and the personal consumption sales numbers, this, how much we're spending, how much we're buying is really strong right now. So this concept of the federal government handing the baton to the consumer to take over is absolutely working. Think of it in this way, pure terms. Have you tried to buy a plane ticket recently? They're really expensive. Why? Because Delta Airlines had more people book flights in the month of March ever in its history, and as did five other airlines. What it suggests is that demand is now through the roof. And demand means higher cost. Usually that's temporary, by the way, because demand wanes as costs get too high. But it also means that consumer is capable of spending. And that's key. 70% of our economy is driven by the consumer. So if stocks are less expensive, the consumer is really strong, 
And it's most of the economy is driven by that. By the way, it's 25% of the global GDP, the rest of the world, and 70% of ours. And the US consumer goes, the rest of the world goes. So that tells me that this talk of recession to me is clearly overdone, very unnecessary. If I was gonna, if I wanted to walk with one takeaway today, yes, it's costing you more to fill up your car. You have in California, six bucks a gallon. And seven. yes, you just seven, sorry. <laughs> and, and yes, yeah. you're today. paying more for food. And you probably pay more for services and goods. But generally, many of those things can be temporary. Not all. A lot of them can be some. Every inflationary period has been transitory. What's not transitory, what doesn't ever go away is wages. Once wages go up, they don't come back down. I had someone make the case to me that rents don't ever come back down. Not true. And, and, a rent, and there are times, there have been many times, when the housing market weakens because of weakens because of the high interest rates, that sure, rents can come back down. Uh, now, it's less common. I'll give that. But... Gasoline, absolutely affected by global supply and demand and inflation. Food, absolutely. Spent. And those are the two most important things to you. So if you increase your wage, let's, let's use a simple example. Let's say you made 50,000 bucks a year and you got a 15% bump because you work into a restaurant. Okay, so now, you're, well, now your wages are 5,700. And truth be told, it's costing you about $1,500 more a year to live right now by the increased prices with food and gas. So if you're spending 1,500 bucks more to live, but you got a pretty significant wage hike. You know, you, you, you ended up making, you know, arguably about 7,000 bucks a year. Aren't you still far ahead of the game? Sure. You're probably ahead of the game by two, 3,000 bucks. Now, let's just say you got a 5% bump because someone only got five. Okay. So that means I got just a $500 raise on my money and, and, um, and, and off, excuse me, $5,000 raise on my money and off I go. I'm still way ahead of the game. And that's why I'm not nearly as concerned about this inflationary scare that we're in as so much what you hear on, on, on TV and the radio. So I spent a lot of time on that slide. I'm going to go through a few other ones pretty quickly. This is the labor market. That orange line there shows you 11 and a half million jobs available. Look at how the job market has skyrocketed during the pandemic of open jobs, people looking for work. And the reason why is because we have 11,500 people retiring a day and the number increased significantly during the pandemic. A lot of people left the workforce because they were simply afraid to go to work or had other issues going on. They received some money and now they're starting to come back in. I don't think we closed that gap. By the way, normally we have about, you see the orange line, there's always been a time we've had open jobs. It's, it's been accelerating since 2012. And it's partly because the boomer generation is retiring. We need bodies. And I, I prefer they come in legally. I'm a son of legal immigrants. I mean, I, I'll let you all figure out the legal side of immigration, but we need bodies. We need immigrants in the United States, probably to the tune of three, 400,000 a year to fill this gap. By the way, that's to a degree inflationary initially, but long-term, it's deflationary. Why? Have you gone into a McDonald's or a Dunkin' Donuts and use a kiosk to go to your food rather than a person? Those represent deflation because you're taking bodies out of the workforce. So one way or another, this problem gets solved. Inflation is still way the number one thing that's had one spooked. By the way, it's not about the war, Russia, Ukraine. That's really not what's causing any of this. That's very marginal in it. What really has caused it all is the price of oil. Far and away, oil is in everything. And whether it's the clothes you wear, the carpet on the ground, the fuel in your car, and so on, the, the plastics and baby diapers. So uh, when you think about this real surge, we did have some good signs in the last inflation print that just came by a few days ago. We saw month over month headline inflation only increased by 0.3. So that tells me that there's a good chance we're at peak inflation right now. And in fact, if you watch the oil market, it's, it's wavering between $100 a barrel to about $110 a barrel which means we're finally have enough demand and supply that are kind of matching each other out, regardless of Russia, Ukraine. Now, we do need to have a fix here. In order for, and my thesis is the stock market, are you ready for this, ends the year positive. And the reason why I think we end the year positive is because one, the Federal Reserve is not gonna hike interest rates 10, 12 times. They're gonna probably hike 50 basis point, half of 1% in June, another half of one in July, and then begin to wane, slow down, see how, they, see how much they fix things for the month of September. And if I'm right, that the administration has no choice but to find a way to get more oil out of the ground and gas if they want any chance of winning in the midterms. And they're going to have to have to maybe put aside the green agenda, at least for a little while, work with the oil and gas companies to increase U.S. supply back to where it was pre-pandemic. We're still down by about 10 to 12 percent per day in the number of barrels we're producing. Unfortunately, we're starting to work with Venezuela, and I think that's an, a, a, economically and socially not the best idea, but there's, there is efforts there to get at Venezuela to bring more oil to market. And the, there's a trip being planned right now to Saudi Arabia to get the Saudis to pump more. 
Assuming some, by the way, if all it, all it has to take is one country decide to meet the demand, then all the other countries are going to jump in because they don't want to miss out on the opportunity. Right now, everyone's playing nice in the sandbox. It takes the administration to fix this. But assuming there's a, a break in the logjam, and we already saw the administration release about 150,000 acres to new oil and gas drilling. They did shut down five permits at the same time. So that's a yin and yang scenario of other lands. But assuming they're going to do something there, and by the way, our peak energy demand is usually the summer. Believe it or not, that's when we use the most oil because of the cooling season and the driving season. We still obviously have to heat homes in the winter, but it's not nearly as much. So we should see a, we should see that begin the, the, the usage begin to moderate in September. So think about September as your key pinnacle moment here. So my thought one is U.S. consumer is very strong. Thought number two, inflation moderates in September. And why? Elections have consequences. I think the, the administration is going to do whatever it can to get oil and gas down. Two, the, the de demand will, will wane off. And three, inflation will begin to come down at that point because of it, and the stock market will roar. So the, that's my number one thesis here. And by the way, the supply chain has been projected to be mostly fixed by then as well. So assuming China is out of their COVID situation, fully up and running, and we've had some time to get folks driving trucks again and reach their work that through. That's the and other so big thing for that. Still on this, I think that this is kind of where there's probably the most variance in where inflation is going to end without, you know, at the end of this year, because Correct. usually you can kind of find some consensus amongst economists. And I feel like right now there's not a strong consensus because no one knows exactly what's going to happen. We know that we're headed down how quick and when and what is, is the wild card um, because of the supply chains. But I heard um, you know, the Fed fund, the Fed target for inflation at year end is four and a half. I don't think we'll quite hit four and a half personally. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we'll probably end up between five and six, but Fed's at four and a half, JP Morgan somewhere around five, John Hancock saying between three and four. So you have this, everyone, right. everyone's kind of, you know, between three and six. But the point being, we're headed down, and if we're headed down with inflation, um, the Fed will take a pause or start to wane on their rate hikes, which the, as soon as they say we're pausing, the market's going to bounce back a bit. And I think more, the more than a bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and I think the important thing to remember is, is two things. One, the year-over-year -year numbers are based on the base case from the prior year. Well, the prior year is, you know, pretty high. You know, we were at 5% inflation last year, same time, the year, year over year numbers are gonna to start to come down just because your base case mm -hmm. is high. And so I think that's important to remember. And if we look at history back to your original point on statistics, every single time, not 90% of the time, every single time since the very first rate hike in any rate hike environment, 12 months following the beginning of rate hikes, which began in March of this year, 12 months following equity markets are positive. That's exactly right. From the slide you see in front of everybody to Christina's point, these are the first rate hike and in every single scenario, 12 months later, there you are in some cases significantly more positive. So something she hit on, I don't really care whether it's 5%, 4% or 7%, it's irrelevant. All I need to have happen, or we need to have happen, is inflation begin to moderate. Once the moderation begins, the market will anticipate that and will do exceptionally well. That's the rallying moment. So and, and it gives the Federal Reserve a chance to pause, to Christina's point, and just the idea that inflation begins to moderate will send the market significantly higher. That's, exactly, that's our thesis. And that's why we think the market ends the year positive, not negative. All right, so just to her point, I'll just touch on a few things. As I mentioned, the early corrections are normal. You see those red dots? Those are what, in any single year, going all the way back to 1980, the lowest of the market that year. And notice in almost all of them, not all, but darn close, in every single one of them, the market ended up usually significantly higher. So just to give you an idea, we were down 34% in 2020 and ended the year at plus 16. So these are normal events, everybody. No reason, in fact, they're not normal from the standpoint that you, volatility is your friend. It's not your enemy. Volatility is that moment to change your risk profile, 
So volatility is that opportunity to actually go out of your way to maybe take some of your cash holdings and invest it in equities. Person, personally, this is what I do for a living. And you know what I would do when I'm doing my own personal assets is buying every stock I can. Uh, every dollar I can get, I can grab to put in the market. So I want to buy things when they're cheaper. It's just that simple. And I think that's how you have to look at these opportunities because they are, as I opened, an opportunity. This is why the market sold off. It is not because of Russia, Ukraine. It is not necessarily because of inflation. A little bit. It's not that big a deal. I, I don't, not buying in that the consumer is going to go into recession because of temporary inflation. And I still believe it's temporary. It's, but every inflation environment is temporary. Maybe it's not going to be three, six months like anticipated, but it's certainly not four or five years. Remember, demographics matter. We have lots of older folks with lots of money who don't spend like they used to. That's what causes inflation to go back down, not go higher. Consumer spending habits more matter to me than the current price of oil. What's happening, though, is on the other side of the pandemic, these bar charts represent what we call just general earnings growth. And you notice in 2016, we had very subdued earnings growth. That was a flat year in the markets. A normal year in 2017, a normal year in 2018, slightly above it. Then we had 2019. Remember, that was an unusual year. The stock market went very high, and yet uh, the, the earnings growth was quite subdued. 2020, the stock market ended up 16%, and yet we had a scenario where the stock market ended up positive. This was all because of the pandemic. So on the other side of that, look at this number here, 45% earnings growth. And now what are we expecting this year? Nine, going back to normal. Why did the market sell off? Because the market had to adjust prices of stocks for normal earnings growth. That's it. As the federal government got out of the way and stopped printing money, pushing up asset prices on everything, homes, cars, everything you buy, and the stock market, when the federal government gets out of the way, like they are now, going back to normal means normal earnings growth, single digit earnings growth in this case of nine and sales growth of seven means single digit stock market growth. And that's why we've sold off because we had to get stocks to where they were reasonably priced again. And sure, inflation plays into, inflation matters because earnings will slow down more if inflation stays too hot for too long. Sales will slow down more if it stays too hot for so too long. But let inflation moderate by, by the end of the year, it becomes a yesterday news, market's anticipatory, stock market rallies around it. It's, it's going to come down to a few things. And, and I'll, I'll kind of close with this and take as many questions as I can. By the way, this is one of the basic things we look at is PE ratios. Why I think the market rallies, this is my third point, stocks are no longer expensive. So when we look at what we call a premium or a discount, is my cereal box more expensive or is it on sale? Right now, stocks versus their 10-year average of the price of the company, price of Microsoft, divided by how much they earn, we call that a PE ratio. I just showed you the earnings a minute ago are cheap. If I showed you that at the beginning of the year, it was a 30% premium. So we went from a 30% premium to a 3% discount. That means finally stocks are less expensive. Same thing for forwards. It's just another way to look at it, forward earnings expectations. And that tells me we are at the bottom of the sell-off. We could go a little deeper if the Fed surprises and hikes a bit more than expected. If some of the language they use a little bit more serious, if the war in Russia, Ukraine becomes bleeds into another border, let's say a Poland or a Finland or a Sweden or something like that, that would be very problematic. S stripping out the unusual moment here. If things go as expected, stocks are probably at the bottom of the sell-off here and we begin a slow grind higher after the second right hike in July. And, and Phil, that's kind of to that point. Um, I mentioned consensus. You can typically find some consensus. Right now, there's a, you know, the consensus is we're heading down on inflation. The range, not a strong consensus, but we're going lower. But to your point, not as important. But the consensus I am seeing amongst all economists is that there is not a recession likely in 2022 or early 2023, to your point unless there's some anomaly with the war or the Fed, you know, oversteps or bounds. But all of this, because there's no recession likely, because we do have a strong consumer, that means corporate earnings have a lot of room to exceed expectations. And if, and at the end of the day, the number one thing in the stock market is corporate earnings drive stock prices. Exactly. Couldn't say there's, there's a lot of room to run. And I know that that's why even JP Morgan, they said, okay, originally they were expecting eight to 10% positive growth on equities for the end of 2022. They said, maybe we're looking at more like five to 8%, but they're still predicting a positive, you know, positive rate of return on the S&P for 2022. Right. 
That's exactly right. So that means if the SP is down 17%, pile in. Pile in and enjoy the ride higher because you're taking advantage of emotional reaction to headlines that aren't nearly as bad as they may not be. I happened to be on a, a broadcast yesterday. I was on Making Money with Charles Payne, and the anchor got mad at me, and the other guests didn't believe me. On Twitter, everyone was beating me up saying, the consumer's in terrible shape. It's just not factually true, and it's Correct. just not true. And, and, and at that, the U.S. economy is in quite good shape. We're growing. We're not shrinking. We're not contracting. We're, we're just growing less than we did last year because we had this abnormal growth from all the, all the work the Fed did. So a normal growth rate for the United States is probably about 2%. We're still going to probably go around 3 3.5%. That's good for stocks. And, and, so, and, so, and to your ask, point on the consumer, um, there was another statistic that came out this morning from First Trust. Um, the consumer only needs to spend 14% of their after-tax income to meet their financial obligations. That's a strong consumer. That goes back to not like, debt, like debt payments on credit cards or something. Yeah, like that. that goes back to the, the chart I showed earlier when I, when I yeah. talk about this year, consumers yeah. are not a lot of debt. Look at that 9%. So if you make a dollar, I'd argue you only owe physical debt. Oh, I'll, no, say it differently. If you're worth $100,000, that's your total net worth, you have $9,000 in debt. It's basically the lowest ever in your lifetime. And, but here's more important. You're financing that $9,000 still at rates that are probably two or 3%, which by the way, if anyone had, if you know history, we know rates were a heck of a lot higher now, but 10 years ago or 20 years ago. In fact, look at the bond market here. This bond market represents when interest rates were much higher, used to make money in bonds. Part of the problem in our portfolios today is that we lost money last year in bonds and we're probably going to lose money this year in bonds. As interest rates push higher, you lose money in bonds. Prices go down as rates go higher. It's a seesaw relationship. Once interest rates level off, which I think happened at the end of this year, and then we'll make about two, 3% on our bonds and go back to stop losing money. But we're going to do different things in the portfolio to make you money. Part of the relationship I have with Christina is that as a money manager for many of you, we're going to have to be more active. We're going to have to take advantage of what markets give us. We're going to, have to do different things than we've done in the last 10 years when the bond market is not as fruitful as it once was because interest rates go back to normal and go back to giving us muted returns every single year. What's part of the problem while you're losing money in your portfolio this year is we're losing money in stocks and in bonds. That doesn't normally happen. By the way, we made money in stocks and in bonds in 19 and 20 and 21. So up to 19 and 20. So now we're kind of paying for that. We're paying for the other side of unusual markets a few years back. Now we're on the other side of that. This should all work its way through the system here by the end of this year going into next year. Yeah, we have a few questions here. Um, Charles asks, do you think the California real estate market is peaked? And would now be a good time to sell the California investment real estate, Charles. I, uh, I think that real estate affordability is driven by wages. I mean, and you guys chime in on this, Phil and Christina. Wages are very high in California. You can't hire anyone for less than twenty dollars an hour in California. I, I was speaking with some clients uh, last week. There are two engineers at Google, a husband and wife team. Their W-2 earnings are one point one million. They live in a two million dollar three bedroom two bath house in Palo Alto. The numbers are just crazy high, but that's affordable for them because they, they have the the earning power uh, to pay for it. But I mean, I personally think California is going to become like um, a lot of parts of California will be like central Paris, central London, uh, Monaco, uh, just these really high end places where people want to retire to and people want to live. And, um, you know, look at Santa Barbara. I mean, the wages- well, what, I will, what I will yeah. say though, Jim, is because uh, I've got several clients that have been doing home purchases and um, mortgage loans. And in speaking with some, one of our mortgage lenders this morning, um, we're seeing appraisals coming lower. We're not seeing, we're not seeing the, you know, 10% over asking price. So you are starting to see a slow. Does that mean real estate prices come down necessarily? That's, you know, no one can prognosticate that, but what you'd still have in California is a lack of supply. Right. So whether that means you have prices come down, I think you at least see a leveling at a minimum. And we are starting to see appraisals not come in for the home price. Which is actually exactly. good if you're buying a house because you can beat up on the seller, right? You can say, well, we, you got to come down off your price. So anyway, Phil. A couple of things I think from an economic standpoint. Yeah. There is a direct relationship between the price of a home and the interest rate payment on the debt that used to buy that home. So when interest rates were 3% on a 30-year, now they're five and a half. So what's happened is we've seen a 5% correction in the price of, of, of used homes and about a 3% correction in the price of new homes, which is minute. I would expect it to go down probably 10 on both. Why? Because as interest rates push a bit higher here, prices automatically come down. But to Christina's point, 
The millennial generation are voracious buyers of homes. And we've also found out, fun at Freakonomics Matter, that most older folks who were anticipated to leave their home and go into a multi-fuse facility, a, a senior sit, are not doing that. Because we're seeing the at-home care statistics explode, whereas those facilities are no longer being built. The reason why most folks want to live the remainder of their life at their home. So what's happening is the boomer generation was expected to flood the market with houses. That didn't happen. We went through six years of underdevelopment, to Christina's point. Uh, basically, after 2008, the number of homes we needed to build per year was 1.5 million. It was only about 750,000. So we are significantly below supply of new homes that we need. So I wouldn't expect the prices to come down a bit. Location, 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 like always. So think of it in this context. Simply enough, homes are up 30% in value over the last 24 months, really the last 12. They'll probably collect by five or 10. And that's it. Because demand is high and supply is limited. And even though higher prices are there, I do agree that I think prices will level off and come down five or 10% because. I would say there's a very kind of granular issue with California is if you own multifamily in California, there are so many laws that protect tenants. A lot of clients say it's too risky because it exposes you to liability that you cannot insure, and they're just getting out of the California rental market. That's a kind of a different different topic. Uh, Anonymous asks, with the consumer spending is mentioned, why does the hit on the stock for a company like Target, or what does the hit on, on a stock for a company like Target say about corporate earnings and the broader economy going forward? I think you answered that, Phil. Yeah, I'm going to just take the other side of what the market's been saying. Yeah. And what the market has said with Walmart and Target that the consumer is about to slow, and I just don't agree with it. I think this was much more about Target and Walmart mismanaging the supply chain issue that they had on their hands and, not, and, and didn't ex expect the wage issue to have as much impact on their bottom line as they had happened. Their gross sales numbers for both firms were up, not down. So it's about those companies. I don't think we're in a, anywhere near a consumer-based recession yet. It's just, just not what's going on. That's just not where we're at today. And Anita asked, do you think interest rates may cap at around 7% and then begin to taper? It wasn't clear on that. You want to call the number? What, what are you thinking? Sure. I think we're there now. So there, you could argue interest rates now, they're not at seven. Inflation is at eight. Interest rates on the 10-year U.S. Treasury are now are 2.9%, which means your mortgage, which is pegged to the 10-year Treasury, is around 5.5%. Now, key point here. I do think the top line inflationary number has peaked but I don't think interest rates have peaked. I think interest rates are gonna push higher here. That interest rates will go to around three and a half percent on the 10 year treasury, which means your mortgage is probably gonna to go to about 6%, maybe six and a quarter, which is the peak of the housing market and, be, and as far as prices declining. So when you see that reversal in mortgage rates begin to go back down, as eventually the 10 year comes back down, the housing market will turn. So to, so to connect that to the next question from Venkat, it's simply that I don't expect a bubble because there's too much demand for houses, but I would expect housing prices to come down a bit. I do think interest rates push higher here through the end of the summer, simply because we know the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates at least half, if not 1% more, maybe 1.5%. So if they do that, structurally, the bond market pushes higher right and locks that bubble. I'll take the next question. I know it's for retirees. Is it better to have a portfolio with growth equities since stocks are cheap right now, or is it too risky? That's a good question. I yeah, it's a great question because you know what, um, the, the old way of doing things, um, the, the, the good old 60, 40 portfolio, as they like to say, and, and as a retire, as you retire, you typically add more bonds to your portfolio and you, but that in the early two thousands, I mean, in 2005, you could get a 5% one year CD. So 5% income on a million dollars used to work for some people, but you can't get with interest rates being so low for so long and they're still low. I mean, even though they're going up, they're still low. You can't have just fixed income in retirement portfolios and outpace the longevity risk and inflation risk. So you have to have more risk in your portfolios today than you used to. I think the, the Wall Street Journal article that um, a lot of us like to point back to is, I think in order to achieve a 7% annualized rate of return in your portfolio, you had to have a standard deviation or a measure of risk of seven back in 2005, 2006. Now I think it's 16. 15 on the standard deviation to achieve a 7% annualized rate of return, you can't do it with fixed income alone. You have to have equities in your portfolio. And so, yes, you have to have growth. You have to have equities. 
Um, to Phil's point, dividends do matter. I think having more dividend paying stocks, blue chip stocks, but it also comes down to the individual client. And if you don't have a comprehensive analysis of what part of your portfolio should be in stocks, what part of your portfolio should be in alternative investments, what part should be in fixed income, you have to have a comprehensive plan. Yeah, Christina, you know, not only do you have to have a comprehensive plan, but everyone needs to know what, what they're doing. So when I say, when I say that, I mean, a lot of people will say, I don't want to put my eggs in one basket. I'm going to go with five different advisors and see how they do. It's like people in a rowboat rowing out a sink. It's that's not helpful. Like they all need to know what each other is doing. And frankly, financial advisors don't work that way. So I recommend that people pick one, right? You can diversify with one advisor, but really seek out, especially in retirement, because this is different than acquiring, you know, it's different than going up the hill, up the mountain, you're kind of going down the mountain in retirement. It's a different way of looking at things. And um, there's also, you cannot ignore the, the pucker factor, which is, you know, the, there's a huge drawdown in the market right now. We're experiencing it. And if you're watching this, you might be thinking, Jim, you're right. I'm nervous. I'm worried. I'm worried I might outlive my money. Those are real emotions that's tied to your retirement. That's why you work with a, an advisor, you know, rather than trying to do it on your own and just panicking and to Phil's point, panicking and selling at the bottom of the market, right? So next question, Kelly asked, do you believe companies like Home Depot, Walmart, Target will be able to continue strong earnings with the rise in costs in business operations? It's a great question. So as I mentioned earlier, I don't think the rise in wages will be that much of an issue. They can pass that on to all of us. And wages don't go up by 5, 10, 15% every single year. It's going to be a one-time phenomenon. Then we'll go back to the rate of inflation. But at least gets everybody a nice boost. There is a point to that, though, that's really important. If the supply chain struggles, and the costs in supply chain stay high, eventually it's gonna hurt their, their impact from earnings. And eventually we're gonna see a real significant correction beyond where we're at today. So the supply chain does matter for people, for firms that produce goods. Home Depot has done a spectacular job of managing the supply chain. And for that, their earnings are strong and the consumer spending it. The other two did not. This goes back to my opening salvo around COVID in China. Let's assume that everything gets fixed by September and we're no longer, we don't have another variant. China's resolved their situation and things are working. That's the projections. We're seeing that trend. This year, out of the first five months of the year, four of the five months inventory restocking has increased. So as long as there's not a supply chain break and we get a modest, modest cur curtailing in the cost of fuel, for example, diesel fuel in the United States is up double. It was $3 a gallon pre-pandemic, now it's six. That gets passed on to all of us. So to your point, right now they're surviving and they're actually thriving. But if this persists, then that's a different ballgame. Then much of what I'm telling you today could be in jeopardy if, in fact, inflation does stay stepping high, oil does stay high, the supply chain doesn't heal, then we're going to have to do something Christina just said, which is where we're positioned right now. Accept higher rates, accept higher inflation. What we do in environments like that, get paid a lot of dividend, earn a lot of income in the portfolio to wait out the volatility to when things finally subside. So I'm not right. concerned about it staying higher. I think it's an opportunity to change the portfolio again. But for today, we've already prepared for that as if it's the worst case scenario. And actually, your portfolios are being rebalanced right now to prepare for it as we speak, actually. And Arlene has, if you guys have a question and you want to ask it, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. We've got one more question here from Arlene. What about the impact of the U.S. national debt and the higher interest the government will have to print, pay, and consequential impact on inflation. Any thoughts on that? Uh, Great question. It's not an inflation issue. It's, it's a budgetary spending issue. Today, of the of the entire federal budget deficit, around two trillion is purely discretionary. We spend around six hundred billion in interest payments. If in fact that that amount doubled to where you went to spend instead of six hundred billion, you're spending one point two trillion, then you have that much less to spend on, on as a government. And government spending is helpful. It drives the economy higher. Now you want to manage, you don't want to overspend, don't spend money you don't have, but the same token, it, spending does matter. So it's interesting though, the average maturity of the bonds held by the federal government is five and a half years. The current interest payments on that debt is 1.5%. So if you look at the size of the country's economy and you look at how much we're spending on our debt payments, believe it or not, it's the lowest in US history. The fact that we have all this debt, it's costing us next to nothing. Now, in fairness to your point, if interest rates stay higher for longer and keep pushing higher, eventually that 1.5 is going to move up. It'll move to 175. It'll move to 2%. It could move to 2.5%. And in that scenario, then we do spend more on our interest payments. And it does hurt discretionary spending. We're just not there yet. 
And if I'm right, then interest rates push higher temporarily and then come back down, it's really not an issue. All that debt we have is financed at the lowest rate in U.S. history. So it's not a big deal. And in fact, truth be told, whether you want to credit the Biden industry, I'm a little apolitical. I don't care. I don't care left or right. Right now, the federal government isn't outspending what it's making. In fact, the month of February, we paid money back towards the deficit. Some of that's COVID hangover, tax issues, things like that. But the reality is the federal government, as of now, spending bills haven't passed. And with the midterm elections looking like it's going to create a divided House and Senate, that means the spending and tax rates won't happen. That means the federal government's going to have to run on a balanced budget for the foreseeable future, which is probably a good thing. And that means the debt should, in fact, come down by not overspending, and we're able to finance it at very low rates. Good, really good question. Well, I have a question. The, the uh, sure. government, uh, Congress passed a bill today or yesterday to to give Ukraine, I believe, another $40 billion or $40 billion, bring it to like $58 billion. Where does that money, where, where does that $40 billion go? So yeah, two say, trillion discretionary spending. Yeah, no, but where does it end up? Does I'm it sorry. come back to U.S. Com- defense firms, essentially? And is that an inflationary type of uh, spending? I mean, is that kind of, kind of countering the inflationary you know, pressures? Not inflationary, but you said something which is really interesting. Uh, and I don't think people realize this. When, when the federal government says we're going to give the, uh, the Ukrainians money, they're not giving them money. They're giving them weapons. Who makes those weapons? Lockheed. Yeah. So uh, it's all, I mean, P- President Biden went down to Lockheed's plant to talk about the, what do they call it? The, uh, anyway, a particular piece of equipment that uh, is very accurate at taking down drones. I forget the name of it. But most of that's not given to them in physical dollars. Some of it is for aid. Some of it is for human- humanitarian aid, food that they can buy. A lot of it's in actual physical goods. Uh, and that goes back to the United States and our company. So it, government spending drives economies higher. Now, you want to manage your spending. If you're not increasing taxes, but you're ballooning your deficit, that can be problematic to the earlier question. That's not where we are today. We just got out of that. In fact, we're going the other way as the Federal Reserve is beginning to take money out and out of, it's actually calling, it's actually pulling money out of the bond market and giving it back to the treasury, which is sitting in reserve. So we're actually taking money out of the supply right now which is why interest rates have pushed a bit higher. Quick fun facts. I mentioned a couple of those in the beginning. These are corrections that have happened all the way back to 1982. And notice every time we've had a correction of 14% or higher, look at the returns one year later. In every single scenario, the market was up except for one. Two years later, every single scenario, the market was up except for two. So it's not to say that it couldn't happen, but boy, I like those odds. You know, when corrections happen, generally the market recovers and recovers quite quickly. Look at how these double-digit corrections were followed by significantly higher double-digit growth in almost almost every scenario. Time to buy stocks, not time to sell them. And typically, I think the uh, average, another fun fact, average rate of return one year following midterm elections is positive on average 36%. So we have two things working in our favor. The beginning of rate hikes that took, took place in March this year, 12 months following that time frame, typically positive on the equity market. Um, 100% of the time, and also one year trailing midterm elections, positive on average 36% on equities. So a couple other fun facts. So this gives you an idea how long corrections, uh, how long it takes to recover from a correction. So you can see generally to recover from a correction on average, four months. These bar charts here all represent all with recovery times of when we had a correction, correction between 10 and 20%. So traditionally it means right about four months, once, if I'm right, that July is the beginning of the recovery, July into August, that'll set us up to be recovered by the end of the year. I'm going to skip that guy. Um, that last one, these are all kind of fun, all similar ideas here, but just gives you an idea of what, oops, sorry, hang on one second. Oop, oop, oop. There we go. All right, PE ratios on the left there. As I mentioned, stocks already gotten cheap, so I won't bore you with it. Notice my chart on the right. Whenever we have, we hit correction territory, average rates of return in those, I did it again, I'm sorry. Average rates of return in the months after will almost always positive and at that around 6% in the beginnings of the recovery. So it's not like we got to wait a year to get our money back. We usually get it back pretty quickly. Uh, and that's that's more than 65, 63% of the time. So history again on our side is being able to recover quickly once the correction ends. Let's get past that. Some things you might want to consider in your portfolio and work with Christina or Jim. One, floating rates. These are called leverage loans. It means they automatically pay higher rates of interest as interest rates push higher. Well, we're expecting the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates at least another 1%, which means that'll put the coupon that you'll get from a floating rate security right about the same you'd get from a high yield bond. 
And yet high yield bonds have an average maturity of around six years, floating rates have a maturity of three months. So that's one, things we, one of the things, the tactics we employ in a market like this. The other thing is buy dividends, good old dividends. These, these charts here on the left, the blue chart represents dividends. The gray part, chart represents companies that don't pay dividends. Notice every time we've had an inflationary period, and this was negative, but less negative. In many of these other environments, the, the, the non-dividend payers were negative in gray, and the dividend payers were blue. What are we doing right now in your portfolios? Adding dividend payers as the outweigh in the portfolio. Good example, 41% of the entire stock market return is due to dividend payers going back all the way to the 30s especially in times of interest rate. All right, so I'm going to open up my screen here. Phil, Go. can you speak to that for just a quick moment? I know Jim and I had a conversation, um, I think a couple weeks ago. And I know that you and I spoke about this back in April um, in, in Big Sky. And we were talking about the, if you're buying an index, I think it's over the last 20 years, if you just bought the ETF index, you don't get the dividends. If you do, you just get lower dividends. Lower dividends. And that was a difference of about a 200% rate of return over the last 20, 30 years. I can't remember if it was a 20-year time frame. Or over the last 20 years. And, and what that means is the reason why in an index that's not a dividend-focused index, the other stocks that don't pay a big dividend will draw down the actual earnings of it. So in an environment like this is what we try to do. When we, we tend, tend to use active managers or active funds, which can focus on companies that are gonna pay a bigger dividend, or you gotta buy a dividend weighted ETF. So what we've done in your portfolios is that is by, if you're in our ETF portfolio using dividend weighted ETFs or, if, or the mutual fund portfolios being very actively managed dividends. If you're one of our institutional accounts, you know we're getting a yield in some cases as much as 4% in stock dividends. Think about that. The stock market just ends the year flat, not up or down. And we were in four percent dividends. Well, then, hey, we just did four percent dividends. So there are ways to survive this. All right. Well, Phil and Christina, thank you very much for uh, spending time with us today. And uh, you make sure you like us uh, or subscribe to us on YouTube and click the little bell so you're alerted uh, when we release new content. Thank you very much, uh, Christina and Phil. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, thanks, Jim. And we'll have a recording for our clients too, um, as well, emailed out for anyone that wants it. But uh, that'll be emailed out on Monday in our weekly economic update. And uh, if anyone wants to reach out to us, they can reach out to us through um, My Ascent Wealth. And uh, if you were to contact us, our website address is myascentwealth.com. And uh, I think that that wraps right. it up for today. So thanks everybody. We hope we gave you some uh, peace of mind. Thank Take you. care. Take care.